All right, well, welcome everyone. Today's presentation is part of the Culture Builds Communities webinar series. This community-based project is designed to help Native communities plan and develop cultural facilities. Culture Builds Communities is a project of the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums. Major funding is provided by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the National Museum of the American Indian, and Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies. Thank you so much for being here today, Art. Thank you very much. Um, let's go on and dive in here. You can read about me later. Um, I've been, I, this is my 50th year of working with museums of all kinds and uh, uh, 35, almost 35 as a museum director and curator and the last 17 uh, as a consultant to all kinds of institutions, large and small, uh, near and far, and uh, a number of tribal communities. Um, today, we're going to talk about getting support for your projects by um, conducting surveys and using other community engagement uh, types. And I want to just mention why it's so important today. Um, for a long time, small groups of people just went in a room and wrote plans. But today, planning needs to be inclusive of all kinds of perspectives and viewpoints and listening is so important. Um, your communities want to be heard. And um, the other advantage that you have is you know your communities and you can make sure that it's uh, a diverse spectrum of ages and genders and personal and cultural knowledge. And the end result is that you will engage the people that are gonna help you to succeed in the end. Um, uh, today we'll talk about some types of community engagement. I'm going to share some examples of survey questions and uh, uh, policies and uh, have two case studies that show uh, one institution that uh, built a building, beautiful building, and didn't settle the governance and programming questions and then 10 years later went back to do community engagement successfully. Uh, the other case study is of a, of a museum project that hit every step along the way, did everything just right, but then stalled because of other circumstances. So, you know, you can, you can do it all correct and it doesn't always happen, or you can uh, just go for it and then correct yourselves later. Uh, online surveys are, are quick and effective ways, um, and you can get them out through your website, your social media. Uh, if you have a tribal newsletter or a newspaper, uh, those are good ways also. Uh, sometimes um, there are lots of people who still don't have an internet connection, and you can do hard copies. Um, you can print out the online surveys and ask people to help you that way. Um, it's a little harder this year uh, because, you know, normally uh, people might go to a, a major community event like Crow Fair and, and uh, hand out surveys and have conversations with people at the same time. Uh, a lot of that isn't happening this year. So uh, I know that at least some groups are planning to mail surveys to every registered address on, on, in the community uh, with a return envelope to get them back. And then it just takes some time on your staff to, to uh, enter the surveys manually so that you can analyze them and then present uh, the results. Personal interviews are great and uh, they often reveal a lot that you might uh, not have known. Um, and of course, you want to interview your tribal leadership, community members, and especially elders with uh, unique cultural knowledge. It's very important and it, it opens up themes that you might not have thought about to program either in performance or in exhibition or in conversation and storytelling. Uh, uh, doing those personal interviews can also reveal to you uh, things that maybe you shouldn't be concerned about or things you don't want to talk to the public about 
or things that have to be discussed and agreed uh, about sensitive information. Again, uh, personal interviews uh, with people in the communities. And I, I think um, one of our speakers addressed the need to get out and uh, interview others uh, in your general region even, uh, who might be at foundations or uh, governments or potential partners. You'll wanna um, prepare good questions for them and uh, you can get quite a bit of information in a half an hour conversation even. Uh, workshops, as you get into your planning process, uh, you might make special invitations to your supporters um, who have special knowledge or uh, special um, ability to contribute stories or collections. And at the right time, when you're planning your building programming, you remember the steps to making your potential programs into your architectural program, it's good to bring people who would be part of those special functions. Um, again, probably, probably there are protocols uh, with your council on uh, how public meetings are run and presented, and you'll want to make sure that uh, you fit into that and that you do lots of updates. Uh, I've been on projects where there was at least one public meeting a month uh, during the planning process and people were very interested and there were always lots of questions and uh, fortunately quite a few answers too. Uh, virtual meetings, uh, you're all veterans now so you know that those who don't live in your community or can't get to the meetings uh, can be brought in on Zoom or WebEx or Google Groups. Um, some people, another one is uh, go to meetings that some, some organizations use. So those are some general uh, engagement types. And um, we'll talk more about some of the specifics in, in another section. Um, does anybody have questions about this first bit or anything they might want to add? Okay, we'll, we'll uh, take a breath and we'll move on. And these are some of the sample online survey questions that have been asked. And, you know, frequently, you know, we really want to know what people want and what would mo motivate them to come and visit and take part. And this is just a basic list, but um, you can probably imagine some more, um, another three or four or five from your own community that you might want to ask about. Um, here are some general questions. And the thing about, the good thing about uh, online surveys is that you can have some questions that are check boxes and it's very easy for people. You can also give them text boxes for responses where they can tell you in detail maybe a sentence or maybe a paragraph, um, some of these other questions here. And you can find out who's your competition, if that's a question. Um, and then, you know, the big question for most is, you know, how do people feel that the center or museum should work towards promoting tribal culture uh, or preserve language and culture together? Language comes up a lot and uh, it's so important. And then you also want to ask people to have a dream with you to imagine what it can be like in the next five or 10 years as it gets going. The, one, one of the case studies today um, started with a uh, community needs assessment and it was done by a consultant who works primarily with tribal educational initiatives and so it was focused, and I'll explain later uh, why it had that focus, but it was um, done through the community school and um, the school board was the original steering committee. And so they interviewed a lot of teachers and a lot of students and some elders. Um, and in the resources, you'll see the demographics summarized. There are lots of different tribal affiliations because many tribal employees um, 
are not from from that community and many other uh, people are actually married in from other pueblos and so there's quite a range of affiliations and a good range of ages uh, positions and occupations and background uh, information so they just said it right out uh, they wanted to know if Okiawinge was planning to seek funds for a museum and uh, uh, they just went right into it, got some good answers. How did you find out? Um, this is part of an effort at that time in the mid 2000s that related to tribal sovereignty issues also. Uh, the, the governor of the Pueblo, Joe Garcia, was uh, also the head of the National Congress of American Indians at that time and uh, you know very much involved in sovereignty issues. So. At uh, the same year that they took back their name from the Spanish name, um, they uh, also uh, honored their hero, Pope, who, who actually led the Pueblo Revolt in 1680. Um, they're planning to house collections of cultural items, and they got some good responses from people who'd be willing uh, to give um, collections from their own families artwork, uh, oral histories, etc. And um, that also gave us leads on potential interviews. And then it's also again, good to ask the questions about what would you want to do when you came? And there was a, a wide variety of those. Uh, question of should other Pueblos be featured? And technology, um, children's, and a lot of good suggestions for exhibits. And <clears throat> a lot of other comments came from that. And that survey is in the resource documents that are uh, already up on the ATOM website. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Here are some of the interview questions that uh, I've been using these kinds of questions um, in communities for 25 years. And, um, you know, people really want to talk about themselves, uh, particularly elders. And you can see that this is kind of geared towards conversations with elders and experienced people. And you'll, you know, you'll, <clears throat> you'll find out what they're interested in telling. And, uh, the one that gets a good response usually is if you had a message to give to the younger people and non-residents about this place, what would it be? And you get, and then all kinds of other comments. And of course, you'd want to adapt this to the personality of your community and what you already know uh, the needs are and who you know. And uh, uh, so this, this isn't <coughs> in any way written in stone. Uh, in the resource files are a sample agenda for a public meeting and every community has its own style. Um, I know in, in most there's usually an invocation of some kind to begin. Um, everyone gets introduced, presentations are made, and at least half if not more of the meeting needs to be a listening session with questions and answers. And then some kind of a, a summary statement and a peek ahead for people who are at the meeting. Um, involving <coughs> specialists from your community in your planning workshops is, in my experience, uh, usually informal. It could just be a phone call or if you're sending email, this is kind of a, a sample invitation um, which acknowledges their knowledge and uh, attaches the agenda and something that's often important uh, if you're inviting the elders is to see if they need a ride to the meeting. And uh, that's usually a very effective way to make sure that they come. Any, any questions about uh, any of those prior slides uh, before we get into the case studies? Okay, if, if not, uh, we'll keep, keep on. And uh, again, <coughs> the Gila River Indian community is large, 828 square miles. And uh, it's large in people too, with 
in 2000, 11,000, and I'm sure there, there must be more like 15 or 16 now. Um, most live there, uh, although it's right on the south side of Phoenix, and uh, there are many people who live and work in Phoenix or at one of its suburbs. And so uh, two groups of people there, Akimel Otam, who used to be called Pima, and Piposh, uh, who used to be called Kukapa, but they've taken their names back. And then Okeowinge, uh, uh, it was a long term of planning and um, you know, the, the sheer cost and the lack of funding and the ideal to renovate the heart of the 800 year old village and provide educational funding and do other economic development. Uh, those took priority uh, in the end, but the plans are still there. So the Huhugam Heritage Center uh, came about because there was a large water settlement and they got contracts to curate the Salt River Project archeological collection. That was a huge water project to divert water for agriculture in Arizona. And uh, they were compensated um, at one point for uh, being deprived of the, the natural normal flow in the Gila River. Beautiful building, but they didn't really decide on um, how they were gonna be governed. That's one of the first questions we wanted people to ask. Uh, they started with a private nonprofit. Uh, the tribal council took it back. Then they tried the private again. And then the council took it back again. And each time that happened, um, the director at the time usually wasn't there any longer. And so big turnover, which really impeded planning for programs and galleries. And um, the last time that the council took it back, it's now a full-fledged department of the Natural and Cultural Resources Division. Um, and it's two clicks to the council in that structure and it's been very stabilizing for them. Um, in 2014, they did a plan that they just finished last year, uh, very solid and they accomplished almost everything. And now they've closed for a year to add another 8,000 square foot wing for more permanent exhibits. Uh, they're going to tell their story going way back. And uh, I think, um, you know, an energetic director who, who was the librarian and who has now been in the director's chair for uh, four or five years, and it's made a big difference for them. Um, I don't know if many of you were at the ATOM meeting in Arizona uh, at the Wild Horse Pass, casino, but we had a wonderful evening out here at the Heritage Center um, with that central dance plaza, which in a way reflects some of the early ball courts of the ancestors. Um, the building in the middle is a large collections care facility. The two buildings on the right are the library and classrooms, and the building on the left um, is retail and uh, temporary exhibit galleries. Um, they did uh, first an internal survey because, you know, again, they, were, they weren't starting up, they were operating and so they had a lot of the normal concerns that any institution that's been around for a while has. And so they uh, questioned each other internally first. And I didn't put all the questions uh, in this slideshow but there's a copy of that survey in your resources for this. Uh, the community survey, they got out widely. Uh, they have a community newsletter and they also have a newspaper. And so there were articles and links about the launch of the community survey. Um, in the seven districts uh, over a huge area of land, uh, there are service centers or kind of community centers and so hard copies were uh, available uh, at the Heritage Center and at uh, links posted and hard copies at all seven districts as well. Uh, I, you know, the, the farthest out district from the museum is probably about 100 miles away. And so uh, distance is important there. Uh, we also went out and did listening sessions at 
five of the seven districts and got fairly good turnouts and lots of elder input there because again, often people didn't have transportation to drive a hundred miles, but they could get a ride easily uh, within their community to the service center. We did planning workshops uh, using the results of all these surveys uh, to start to mold the plan. And that was uh, museum staff, the division director for cultural and natural and council members, um, which was really wonderful. Uh, they participated fully. And so no surprises uh, along the way because they knew what was going on. Um, the museum also hosted open houses and uh, special meetings of different groups uh, at which uh, they could present progress and also collect more survey information. So all that, all that led to a, a really good plan. And in the end, the focus became uh, what they call Otlam Hundag which is their lifestyle generally. And they, so it's more native plants, more uh, native language in the exhibits, more um, language workshops, uh, you know, more uh, games and more uh, festivities that relate to the total lifestyle. And that resulted, um, this plan is in the resource box. And I think you'll, uh, it might benefit you to see the process they used and how they put their cultural interest in the fore and redid their mission that uh, you know really promotes cultural survival and and uh, and not more than survival but to flourish and so you'll see you'll find those uh, documents on the website for those things. Now, at Okeawinge, uh, this is very current again. Um, you know, there's a lot of protests in New Mexico right now of removing statues of Oñate. And um, they first met Coronado in 1540 when he was lost and looking for food. And then um, Castaña de Sosa came back in the mid-century. And then uh, not till 1698 did Oñate come up to Okeawinge, and they had two villages at that time, right where the Rio Grande and the Chama River come together. Um, Okeawinge, uh, place of the strong people, was on the east side, and another village, Yungge Oinge, uh, was on the other side. Well, uh, you know, the story is that that the people generously gave Onyate the second village uh, to make his capital. Uh, the stories vary, as you might imagine, about that. Um, he called he called that one San Gabriel, and uh, he named Okeawinge after John the Baptist, hence San Juan Pueblo, for many, many years. But again, they took back their name in 2005, as many groups in New Mexico are doing. Um, a preliminary plan was completed in 2006, and master plan in 2008, and... Uh, at that time, it just shows you, I don't know how your communities are organized, but at OK, um, there's a very strong moiety system. Uh, summer, winter, squash, turquoise, uh, summer, winter. And uh, the governorship rotates every two years. And so the person from the other moiety comes in. And uh, Joe Garcia was um, summer and uh, very intent that that this project go ahead as a educational project, and uh, then the, the the other moiety wasn't that interested. So there was often a two year delay between steps in the process, and uh, ultimately at the same time, um, the community had some great opportunities to entirely renovate the core of the old village of Okewinge, and. Uh, keep the form and the feel, but put modern amenities and uh, improved structures and uh, working, uh, Sean Evans, who you've heard from, uh, the AOS people um, worked on that and they have done a wonderful job and they have multiple stages and there's good funding for that. 
there wasn't so much funding for the museum project. And, and so there's economic development going on, educational uh, things going on. And the plans are all ready for this. Uh, and they're very complete. Um, but it's awaiting its time in history at this point. Um, I just want to say that an example at OK of how one person's passion can drive projects that gain community acceptance. Um, Herman Agoyo is a wonderful man, uh, a farmer, an athlete, a, uh, uh, a master's in education, uh, tribal realty officer, uh, and like so many people that were involved in this planning, um, a former governor and permanent tribal council member and an important person in the cycle of uh, religious ceremony at the Pueblo. He grew up, uh, his cornfield and pepper field are on top of the former first capital of New Mexico. Oñate was only there for about 10 years and then moved it all up to Santa Fe, uh, to Ogopogue. And uh, so as a kid, he helped the archeologists excavate the ruins. He dreamed of the museum and they started different planning. Initially, they worked with the Park Service and the state um, with the thought that it could be made into an important uh, historical site uh, for everyone to learn about. But over time, it became clear that the community didn't want a horde of tourists streaming through the village over to the other side of the river to uh, visit Yungye Wingye. And so the emphasis then moved to planning a uh, museum on the east side that would be accessible to school kids and also accessible to tourists without entering the village on, uh, on days when it's closed for ceremony. Herman was also instrumental in placing uh, the image of the Pueblo Revolt leader, Pope, into the National Statuary Hall. So the name change and the statue which is a beautiful piece by Cliff Frawa, sculptor of Hamas Pueblo. Uh, that went in the same year that they changed the name and, and he was enshrined in the, in the place. Controversy today in New Mexico, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, he led a very successful and bloody revolt that drove the Spanish out for 12 years, but uh, is revered by the people. Now the museum itself, again, began with that community needs assessment. Uh, the whole process, I, and I think this is a good one, uh, you, many of you probably do it already, but every step in the, in the process uh, it, uh, was a resolution that authorized the seeking of funding and how it would be used to move to the next spot. And uh, again, the, the first committee was really the school board. Um, OK, Wingi had uh, freed its schools from the BIA and has a day school and an um, elementary school uh, on the Pueblo. And so the education department and the school board were the ones who got things going. And then a community advisory board was formed. And most of the people on it uh, had the, the triple jobs that most people do. Uh, they were, um, you know, they had day jobs, perhaps in Pueblo government, perhaps not. They had um, religious and ceremonial jobs. And then they had uh, this job advising on the development of the museum. And uh, they were really uh, essential to that. And they, they included uh, a few non-tribal members like uh, uh, a famous uh, archeologist who specialized in botanical uh, expertise. <coughs> Richard Ford, uh, who lives in Santa Fe, was on there, but everyone else uh, was a community leader of some kind. Um, <coughs> lots of community meetings. We started with the preliminary plan, having community meetings, and community members even came to um, when we put out the RFP for architects. Uh, for the master plan, uh, community members were involved in the participation, listening to the presentations that were made. Uh, we did interviews uh, with community members. Uh, the committee traveled 
uh, a very long day. We visited the Po Museum in Powake, Pueblo, uh, the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture at the Museum of New Mexico, the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center in Albuquerque, and the Haku Museum at Acoma Pueblo. And uh, there's a list. I didn't put all those uh, site visit questions up on the screens here, but there's a very long list of questions that we uh, asked our hosts as we, as we went on the site visits. And that might be helpful to you as you plan for your, your other participation in this project. Uh, and then we, you know, we ended up having a community meeting about once a month and a tribal council update about once a month. And that worked well. So these are very complete documents. Um, you'll see the summary, assessment summary. The preliminary museum plan, I think, made it a lot easier for the master plan because we'd done a lot of the legwork uh, that Sean talked about earlier in preparing the program um, and even the site selection so that um, it would be a lot easier for the design aspect and uh, to concentrate on bringing the things from the preliminary plan into the master plan. And um, you'll want to definitely look at the master plan. And there's so many good pictures and research that was done that actually the side light of that is it is being used now, uh, that photo library to look at uh, the renovation of, of the core village as well. Uh, as the dust was settling, we also took a look at the market and the program and the way forward uh, sustainability plan that might be of value to you also. Uh, there's the interview questions for elders, the site visits and the agenda for one of the public meetings. So you can see how that was framed. Uh, questions about these two uh, case studies. This point, so you can see um, one just got out there and did it and then caught up later and one uh, followed all the steps that you might want to and that you're probably doing right now. And, uh, and then, you know, priorities within the Pueblo uh, dictated otherwise. And, and yet it's all waiting there. So it's really important to uh, make sure that you've been refining your reason for being, whether that's uh, a single statement or whether it's a, a mission statement or your vision of what you want to do. Um, ideally, you'd be working on that right up front um, um, as you're starting, as you're answering all those initial questions and as you begin your planning process. So that way you can better use what you're hearing in the process itself. Um, very important to assess who you want to involve. Um, you can get outside consultants to conduct the interviews and assessments and um, something that might be attractive to you. There's a lot of native owned firms that do these things. And uh, if you, if you just Google native owned community engagement services, you'll have a very good head start on seeing who's out there that you might want to have help you uh, with that work. Uh, obviously you want community leaders, people who have a lot of passion, people who are connected, and then uh, individual tribal members. And we found this uh, uh, at both of these places at Huhugam Heritage Center and at Oke Wingay a lot of tribal members who um, weren't necessarily community leaders, but had lots of great ideas about what were important to tell. And then as we've discovered in our Zoom world, uh, it's good to have younger members who can help you out with surveys and other kinds of tech solutions along the way. <coughs> Pardon me, it's allergies here still. Now, putting it together, uh, again, deciding how and when you want to announce your efforts. Um, that's very important because it gives you good press, even though much of what you're doing might not be apparent to anyone yet. Uh, people are generally glad to hear something happening. And um, 
you'll want to begin making kind of a database of people who have expressed interest, uh, who uh, have been to, you know, take, take the roster at the community meetings of attendees and speakers and uh, make that database. And there may be several ways that you'll want to contact them. And, and then you can invite them to the meetings, to events, uh, workshops, or planning sessions. For the interviews, um, you know, again, in person, if possible, um, something that works well if, if you can't go to people's homes, um, you know, for example, at, at Okinawinge, they have a wonderful community library and uh, the Posawa Library and uh, a, a real meeting place for elders and for youth because they have a computer lab and uh, that's a good third neutral place to, to meet if, if possible. Telephone or Zoom, but again, that has limitations. Um, you need to give yourself some time. I know it must seem already like you're, you're rolling pretty fast, even in isolation, but um, you do need time to collect all the feedback from the surveys and the meetings and analyze it and pick out the big things to give serious consideration to in your planning. Um, and be sure uh, to keep no surprises, uh, ask to book time uh, for presentations to the council or other groups that might be decision makers. It's, it's really important um, that they see that things are proceeding, uh, that, that you're paying attention to them and they're not having to come find you. And uh, that is a pretty effective thing. Now, the thing about community engagement is that you might do it to start, but you don't ever stop. Um, you need to apply what you learn, certainly, but you need to keep maintaining good relationships going forward because that's how your center or your museum will begin to prosper and to grow over time. Keep those good relations going. So that is about it for this slideshow, but I would answer any questions that you have at this point. You can un unmute yourself and just ask out if you want or else put it in the chat room. All right, what questions do we have? Hi, Jessica. <laughs> Hi. So um, I actually have a, a uh, thank you very much. First of all, it was um, very informative and I look forward to uh, referring to the references you uh, talked about. Um, I was interested in a tangent discussion and if you'd like to uh, me to ask the question another time, it was about the funding um, for one of the projects you said was initiated, um, the Huhugam cultural or heritage center you said right. was um, regarding a water settlement. And um, we may have a similar situation for funding our cultural um, facility. And so uh -huh. I, I was wondering, is that a section 106 mitigation? Um, and, or, or maybe is there a person or, or um, people to contact to ask about that? Yeah, there, um, you can actually go to, um, there's a discussion of that on the, the website, the community website. Uh, that's uh, G-R-I-C yep. uh, dot org, I believe. Okay, okay. And, um, and then the, the other part of that is that, that they got uh, some very large projects, uh, contracts to take care of the archeological collections from the Salt River project. And uh, they also became a, uh, a center for uh, repatriation and uh, you know archaeologists in Arizona have been digging up the Gila River community for you know 100 years or more and uh, there were a lot of collections um, held by the BAA in the custody of the Arizona State Museum uh, mostly from the big excavation at Snake Town uh, which is out west of the community, and um, they facilitated the return and the reburial of a lot of the collections from there. So that was another function, and that's why there's that big, beautiful collections care facility right in the middle of the complex. 
but uh, it was fortuitous, but the, the water issues had been, you know, the, the Gila used to have a lot of water in it and then it didn't. And uh, so I think there was a multi-year, I don't know if it was a lawsuit or a conversation, but that was part of it. And I, I hope that works for you guys too. Thanks. Sure. All right, what other questions do we have? So um, there, you know, the Gila River community is um, relatively corporate because they have uh, the, the beautiful Wild Horse Casino nearby and that's a huge business. And they have other resources that they developed um, in their community that actually provide a real stable government and stable funding sources. And uh, that's very important. One of the outshoots that came from, from the planning project at uh, the Heritage Center is that uh, all, all four uh, Otham related museums in Arizona formed an association. And, and so that's Tohono Otham, which used to be called Papagos down near Tucson. Uh, the Akchin community, which was an offshoot of Tohono O'odham, and they have an eco museum, and then um, of course the Akimel and Pipash, and then the Salt River uh, people uh, are called Onk O'odham, and they also have Pipash people with them. And so those four now meet regularly. They plan some programs in common, and that was a real positive uh, outgrowth. And that was actually a suggestion made by one of the elders. Um, in one of the listening sessions. So that was a, a very positive development out there. Well, um, you're all welcome to get in touch with me uh, anytime if you have other questions about it. And I'll be putting out a, an invitation by email to, you, to all your teams uh, this week um, with all of my contacts so that um, if you do have questions that come up, uh, ATOMS engaged me to um, you know, to, to answer your questions, to uh, review your your progress, to critique your work, and to suggest other resources that maybe didn't fit into the slideshows. So um, don't hesitate Art? to do that. Art? Yeah. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I do have a question. And I, sure. I got on 10 minutes late, so I don't know if you addressed it or not, but do you do advanced market studies, or I'm just wondering about going into it knowing, I mean, you can't be certain about sustainability, but I'm just curious about the question of sustainability for projects. Yeah, we looked at, okay, Winge, we looked carefully at the marketplace in uh, Rio Arriba County. And, um, you know, okay has always been a crossroads. It was the end of the, of the, uh, uh, Camino Real from Mexico City to New Mexico. It was the start of the trail to California and a lot of trading of uh, horses and commodities and uh, jeans over the years. And um, it's still in a wonderful place at that, at that conjuncture of rivers. And so <clears throat> we went and looked at all the other cultural organizations and touristy things uh, nearby, everything from Bandelier National Monument to um, a, a new museum that's being built by the Sikh community. And we looked at those. We looked at all the museums where uh, there are OK Wenge collections uh, in terms of partnerships and borrowings. We looked at the county comprehensive plan and projections for m employment and growth. and uh, in all of those measures, OK was well-placed right in the middle of things. So uh, I would recommend you take a look at the sustainability plan. Um, I think it was the giant construction price tag in the end that helped it to not be as much of a priority. But um, you know, eventually, that museum can be the centerpiece of that whole part of the Rio Grande Valley. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, okay, thank you. 
there's a lot of people doing, you know, high level market studies. That's, that's not what I do generally. But I hope that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Joan, are you planning on doing a funding and um, what would it be called a funding feasibility study or a sustainability study? Are you planning on doing that? Yeah, I think that'll be a part of what we're doing. We're really in the beginning stages, but um, sustainability and the ability to keep going forward, because I know sometimes centers are built, but then they don't have the ability to keep funding themselves or being sustained. So, yes. And then also yeah. maintenance, uh, sustain, you know, the ability to sustain in terms of maintenance, maintenance endowment or whatever is needed. Well, it's not a big secret that 95% of museums of any kind in America are undercapitalized. Um, there's just not enough uh, security there. And uh, I, I'm really encouraged by the fact that so many people are taking this time out to plan seriously for what happens next. And it's not about closing things down or giving up or stopping, but it's about being smart about how you come back and, and mm -hmm. how you begin. So uh, good luck. Those can be very informative. Uh, I, I even learned how to get traffic counts, you know, <laughs> from the state and it's all those are important factors to consider. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. And Joan, another aspect of this project are the case studies that we're doing with the 10 model programs and sustainability is a large part of that. Um, and, and how people are continuing their operations. For example, uh, some communities have a percentage of their gross revenue set aside for culture, and that helps provide a consistent source of funding. So we will be getting into that as we go further along. Okay, thanks. thanks for bringing it up. And Jessica, did you have another question? Yeah, I appreciated the um, uh, introduction to some of those interview questions and some of those um, you, you mentioned the questions that uh, you had participants use um, when they went to visit other centers to, to um, just be collecting data. Do you have those uh, provided in our resources? I haven't looked at, at yeah, those, there, that list the, yet. There's a single uh, sheet with a whole bunch of questions on there. And it's what you might suspect that would help you with your um, programming for architecture, your, you know, your governance, how you're going to make policies, etc. And uh, I think that uh, you know, if you have a chance to look at the websites for um, the Haku Museum, Indian Pueblo Cultural Center, Mayak, and Poa, uh, P O apostrophe E H, in Powaki Pueblo. Um, they all have a slightly different approach, uh, but they're all doing a great job. And, uh, you know, they just talking about community meetings, uh, <clears throat> Brian Vio, who was, who's an active ATOM participant and was the first director of that museum told me that over a several year period, he had to go to 95 or more community meetings. Uh, so it was a huge process with lots of uh, things to figure out and they did a beautiful job at it. Um, you'll enjoy that. Indian Pueblo Cultural Center just uh, renovated their permanent exhibits after decades and uh, they're magnificent and they take a very personalized uh, approach to people uh, by the people and uh, you know that's a pan Pueblo organization and uh, the, they have a council that's made up of people from all the Pueblos in New Mexico. Mayak is in the process of renovating um, their long-term exhibit, which has been up for a long time. And uh, that's going to be a, a major project when it opens in another year or two. Uh, Bruce, are you still on here today? Uh, yes, I'm still here. Hi. Do you want to... Hi. Hi. Good, to, good to hear you. Uh, do you want to take a second to mention what's going on at Poe? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Bruce Bernstein, and I've been involved with the Poe Center uh, for several decades, including the planning of it with then Governor, then Lieutenant Governor George Rivera. And I'm going to present on the Poe Center and uh, the return of uh, Smithsonian Collections to it on July 8th. So I'm just going to 
to well, save that up a bit. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice segue into your next into your yeah. show. Then, excellent. We're, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about in those sessions the locating of collections uh, and then how to begin to discuss um, returning uh, the collections, uh, both intellectually and maybe physically, but really reuniting native intellect with collections and the importance of that. Importance of that. That's great. And you know, in the on the Atom website, there, from the very first webinar, there's posted uh, the uh, uh, school for advanced research uh, protocols for communities and museums and museums and communities. And if you haven't looked at those yet, they might be useful to look at ahead of what Bruce is going to tell you. So. Um, if there's anything else, we can uh, continue. If not, I would wish you all a good day and uh, look forward to to seeing more of what's going on. All right. Thanks a lot. Any other questions? Hmm? All right. Well, thank you so much. I hope everyone has a great week and we will see you on July 8th. Let us know if you need anything. Bye. Bye-bye. Right.